7 o'clock, we'll call the planning board meeting to order. Uh, can everybody hear me? Do we need the microphone? Need the mic. Okay. Um, just a few ground rules. Um, anybody will be able to speak tonight, be respectful, your name and address, and two minutes at a time. And when you go to speak at the microphone over there, please walk around your left side to that mic. Don't walk around the right side because there's a whole bunch of wires and everything else for the TV stuff. We don't want anybody tripping or tearing it out. You're making a get to her, okay? Mr. Reedy. Thank you. I'm trying to project without the use of a microphone. Thank you very much, Mr. Very Chairman, members of the board. I'm Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson over in Amherst uh, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, we've got the same cast of characters that we've had for the past two hearings. Um, I'm happy to run through, or, or maybe if and as they're called up, they can introduce themselves uh, to answer the questions that you have, if any. Uh, so we were here, or we were over at Hopkins uh, July 17th, earlier this month. Um, went away with a little bit of a, a list um, of a few items, and I just wanted to go through those items. Uh, probably one by one is the easiest, and then to address them as fully or sufficiently as you'd like to. Um, can we get the projection? Perfect. So the first change that you'll see um, is to the library parking, those parallel spaces on the northerly access aisle. One of the things that we heard last time was that um, what's the proximity of those spaces to the building and upon further reflection we were able to eliminate, I believe, five of those spaces, leaving one that you see there on the northerly side of the library, while still complying um, with the uh, one per 400 square feet of gross floor area. You'll see at the top of it, on the top left side, we've got 35 spaces provided. Um, we've got a 30 required plus two of employee spaces, so we're provi providing 35 spaces. Uh, what we've also done on the right side is to show that uh, we are still compliant with the two to one uh, parking ratio for the senior center. So you've got 13,176 square feet multiplied by two gets us to the 26,352. Uh, so that's required and we are providing a bit more than that, about less, a little less than 400 square feet uh, of that. So that's the first piece um, that we changed. The next one, if we could get the slide up showing the landscaping, the Arborvitaes. So what we also heard last time was um, the location of those Arborvitaes and to extend them essentially along the entirety of the plowed field to the north of the site. And so what we're proposing is 64 Arborvitaes, three to four feet tall at planting. And you'll see that along the northerly property line. And we've also added on the southerly side uh, 17 arborvitaes, also three to four feet tall at planting. And so we think with that, we've hopefully satisfied the, the northerly abutters concerns and also added a little bit additional screening on that southerly side. Um, you also should have received uh, a letter from the Department of Public Works as far as the location of where the snow will be stored. Uh, in case of those uh, high volume snow events. And I think you've got that in your packet. I'm happy to go into more detail if you'd like, uh, but I think the letter is pretty self-explanatory. Um, I'd like some more detail on that. Sure. So I'm happy to, probably best for me to quote or read as much from the letter as possible. Um, so the letter was made in response uh, by Marlowe uh, to the planning board's request where the snow would be hauled if removal was needed uh, at the future sites of the senior center and the library. There are a number of sites outside of the aquifer that this can be accomplished. Uh, every winter brings different amounts of snow and ice. Some years there may be minimal to no removal and it could just be pushed on site. Um, others may require, other years may require significant removal. Uh, the town-owned property behind Russell School to the west 
as a primary site in the field area next to Hopkins Academy between the Russell School and the Hopkins Academy parking lot uh, is a secondary or overflow uh, snow storage area. Those two sites meet the zoning bylaw as it pertains to the Aquifer Protection District. Um, the intent is to remove the snow from the two sites within a reasonable amount of time after a storm when needed, and in most cases on regular paid time rather than overtime. Uh, the school superintendent and Marlowe have had a positive discussion on this process, and they would add these areas to the spring cleanup list uh, as they do on other municipal properties. So hopefully, with that explanation and the identification of alternative or, or storage locations for those high volume storms, well, hopefully we have a sufficient plan in place. I'll tell you right now, I can't see anywhere on that site you're gonna, uh, you're gonna uh, store any snow. I mean, you're gonna trees, trees to the north, trees to the south, parking lot to the border, parking lot driveway up to the border there, where I plowed snow for many years, I've never seen such a cluster mess as this. Jogs in here, jogs in there. This is a disaster, it really is. I don't know whoever thought of this, but they probably didn't think about uh, New England putting it in here where the, the snows come. And I guess <clears throat> I like to find out just what kind of expense is this going to be put on to another board, because. If these guys don't take this and put this in their budget, what's it going to cost them? Ten, twenty thousand dollars a year for this, at least. I guess a couple of responses. When you say these guys uh, specifically, who are you talking? About? Both the library and the senior center. Um, I would think that your Department of Public Works. I mean, they've had the opportunity to review this plan, and it's been designed in concert with what they think is a reasonable expectation for the maintenance of this property. I don't think anybody's trying to set the town up uh, for failure as far as snow removal, snow storage. And so, you know, John, I'm, I'm no expert on snow removal, uh, but I, would ha I have to trust the folks that, you know, the civil engineers and specifically Marlow over at DPW understands the sites, the constraints, un is familiar with New England winters, Massachusetts winters, Hadley winters particularly and feels comfortable with the design uh, and the ability to remove the snow. But there is nothing in their budget. They're not even budgeted for this. And again, I plowed for years. I mean, there's no place on this site. Where are you going to put it? In the middle on the sidewalks? Can't do that. You can't leave it on the road. You can't leave it in a parking lot. And then what happens on the other end where the Legion pushed all their snow right where this building's sitting, the senior center. Where's that snow going to go? Nobody cares? No answer? No, I think there's an answer. I, I, I don't know the answers. I don't know what the uh, Legion is going to do to push where they're going to push their snow. I would think that there's probably some area on the westerly side of their property where those parking spaces are. I know beyond them is some vegetation, but they could probably push some that way and probably some towards the north, you'll see that there is, even on the uh, town property, there's green space uh, over by where that transformer is in the southeasterly corner. There's going to be nothing left around both sites for that. And that's a concern I have. Sure. No, nobody's given me a, a real good answer to this. Marvel's not budgeted for it. Marvel has no estimate for this. And it's very easy. Go back 10 years snowfall, square footage, and there's what's going to calculate on the average snow to haul out of here. Okay. They bid, bid these kind of jobs all the time. It's not well thought of, not at all. Question, why was the parking spaces eliminated on the north side of the library? I think because of the proximity to the building itself, just having all of those along that I asked side. the question last time about how close they were to the building, i.e., could you open your door up? And maybe you figured out, I don't know. You, and you could, but I think um, the library building committee is much more comfortable with this design that we have proposed in front of you with additional, a little additional green space on the northerly side of that library uh, as acting as a buffer between the access aisle and the building itself. 
Uh, one of the other things that the board had asked for was um, a final peer review for, for Berkshire Design to take a look at the test fit data or the drainage calculations for both library and senior center in light of the test fit data, and then also to look at a mounding analysis relative to the groundwater. Uh, we expect Mark Donald from Berkshire Design here any moment. We've asked them to come and we expect them within the next five to ten minutes. Um, but we're happy to have, we've got George Costa, uh, our geotechnical engineer, who did the mounting analysis. And I think I, I see the colorized uh, exhibits in front of you. If you'd like a brief or incredibly thorough explanation, I'm sure George can provide either to you. Um, well, if Mark's going to be here, I, I, saw, I just saw a car pull in. Let's, I'd rather wait until Mark gets sure. here to make sure that everything is agreed upon. Sure. So then maybe moving on uh, to one of the other items was the request for the Dover Amendment letter, or as it turned out, an email from Town Council Joe Bard. And I think you will have received that essentially uh, identifying the library use as a... Uh, so Mark, how are you? Um, we're just about to get into the peer review if you want to hang out here with me. So if it pleases the chair, we can either have put Mark right on the hot seat or... Yeah. Go, go, like go, to the, uh, go to the, yeah, the peer review and the mounting analysis, please. Okay. So we were just talking about the peer review of the test bits, um, verifying the drainage calculations and the drainage report provided to the town. And then also we've got George Costa here, our geotechnical engineer, who did the uh, mounting analysis to talk about the, um, the groundwater and its non-effect on surrounding properties. So if you'd like a presentation or if you'd like Mark, either way is fine by us. I mean, we've got the peer review letters and everything is clear and good, so really, unless somebody has a question on it. <clears throat> we got a four, over $14 million project here. And you should be here explaining in detail what the heck's going on with this drainage. I have great concerns of that water. Once this thing is done and said, and if it drifts over to the south by all those houses with, with uh, stone foundations, they're going to end up with mold in, the, in those cellars. And I want to know who's going to be responsible, you or that guy, if that does happen. <laughs> the, drain, the peer review letter is not to give us an in-depth review of the analysis. That would be up to the design engineer themselves. What we've often requested of the peer review engineer is a simple, clean letter that says the analysis is correct, we agree with it, whatever that might be. We're not asking them to give a great in-depth review, but that would be up to the engineer to provide. And I believe that's what they're trying, going to try to do with this mounting analysis. Um, that's correct. We did review the um, analysis, the drainage analysis, and the uh, hand tooth mounting analysis, uh, which George Costa provided. I looked at the calculations and the assumptions that he utilized in that calculation, and I concur with um, the design and assumptions that he quoted and the anticipated uh, impacts associated with this project. He examined it in a 100 year storm based upon the information that he obtained and provided to us. So I don't disagree with his calculation. I concur with the calculations that um, he provided. How long does the peer review take hourly wise? Does it take you 10 hours, 20 hours, 25 hours, 30 um, minutes? Again, this was sort of a convoluted peer review because we started out being hired just to review the uh, senior center with just a cursory look at the um, library because the library was not completed at that particular point in time. So how much actual time did you spend in your peer review? Uh, of both the library yeah. and the senior yeah. center. I don't have total hours, but I'm going to say it's probably 14 or 15 hours. $14 million job. Okay, want to proceed with the this mounting analysis? Sure. Sure. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm George Costa. I'm uh, the project geotech engineer for the senior, senior center, and uh, I was retained by Colliers to uh, do the mounting analysis from not only the senior center but the, uh, the new library also. 
So I'll start off with a little bit about the explanation of mounding, what it is, how it forms. It happens on the ground, we don't see it, so this is going to give a little insight as to what's going on in the ground when water infiltrates the ground. So that's a cross section. You're looking at a basin on uh, top at the ground surface, the foundation on the left, and the water is percolating through the bottom of your basin and it starts to collect uh, on top of the water table. The water table is the lower blue portion of the screen. So this, too, this isn't a cross section of this property, it's just it's on this planet, a textbook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. An, an illustration, yeah, exactly. And, uh, but what's happening on site is very similar to what you're seeing here, what will happen on site, that is. <clears throat> so as water comes through or percolates through the ground, starts to build up on, on top of the water table and a mound forms, and we call that the mound. So, uh, stepping aside from the water, I'll use a, a comparison here. So if I have a container of sand and I pour this container of sand, it's going to form a mound, a pile on the ground. And the height of that sand pile, the mound, and the width depends on how long I continue to pour the sand for, how much of a rate, how fast it's pouring out of the container, and that will build my height and my width of my mound of sand. Same thing happens in the ground with water. It's dependent on how fast it's infiltrating into the ground, how long it's infiltrating for, how many hours. Uh, it also is, uh, pertains to the geometry of the system on the ground surface. And then you get into the soil conditions, how well the soil drains and how deep the groundwater table is. That affects the height of the mound and the width of the mound. And you, you end up getting a parabolic shape like that. And that, that's what we call uh, a groundwater mounding and we do the analysis. If you look at the left side of the screen, you have a foundation of a structure. And uh, if you then look at the mound, uh, as that mound grows, it's going to grow in height and width, and it's going to start to expand laterally. And eventually, the, uh, depending on the condition, the mound can travel underneath the building. And what we look for is, will the surface of the mound uh, come in contact with the foundation of the building? And we look measuring the vertical separation between the bottom foundation of the mound. So I just want to walk up to the screen and show you. <coughs> so we're looking at the same thing. It's the distance between uh, the bottom of the foundation and the surface of the mound. So this mound will extend laterally, it'll grow, and we're always tracking that separation. So if the top of that mound uh, is below the surface of the slab, then water does not intrude into the basement. And that's how the analysis was performed, checking that criteria. So. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the background. That's an isometric view of the mound. It's kind of a 3D appearance to show you what it looks like. It's a good comparison is a sand pile. If you can picture a sand pile, uh, a groundwater mound is very simple. Okay? So that is the, the, the analysis or the, the description of groundwater mounding. So we performed a, uh, a mound analysis for the site. We used a standard procedure, um, a method that's, that's widely used in practice. It's called a Hentouche method, developed in 1966. The USGS, United States Geological Survey, prepared a, a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, to do the analysis for that. Um, it's been verified. Uh, they've confirmed that it's accurate, and they release it for public use. So that was used to determine the analysis for this. We analyzed a 100-year storm event. We took into consideration the highest, um, highest estimated water table, groundwater table, which we, we consider to be the worst case scenario. Uh, we looked at the 100-year storm event, and then we concluded that the mound that would form underneath the infiltration system, we took four systems into account, two in the senior uh, center parking lot and two in the library property. Uh, that's a good one right there, yeah. And uh, so to the right of the screen, you see the two systems for the senior center. The, uh, the library, there's one on the back side of the library, on the east side, it's not shown on there. And there's a small one at the front, uh, front north side, thank you. So we have one and two for the uh, senior center. This will be the, the third, which is uh, for the library, it's a long rectangular one. And then there's a small one here, a fourth, for roof leaders. So we took into account those four uh, infiltration systems working at the same time for a 100 storm event. And to simplify the, the analyses, which was a conservative approach, it gave us results uh, for conditions worse than what we would expect. Instead of doing these as an individual system, we made a large uh, infiltration system. We filled in the center here with more infiltration. That increases the size by about 22% compared to what's really going to be built. So we overloaded the ground with more water than anticipated. 
And the results, we looked at all the units, the houses along Middle Street on the south of the site, and we looked at number 44 uh, Middle Street in the northwest corner. And the analysis showed that for the 100-year storm event, we have uh, a groundwater rise underneath the foundation, the edge of the foundation that is closest to the senior center of six inches or less above the estimated high groundwater table. So, with, and, and over at 44 Middle Street, we had um, probably an inch of rise in the groundwater table at 44 <coughs> Middle Street. So the rise in the groundwater, the static groundwater, uh, underneath these structures is minimal. It's very small and almost negligible, six inches or less. Uh, with that rise, we still had a separation between the top of slab of these basements of these surrounding houses and the groundwater elevation of uh, about six feet to 15 feet. So there was still six to 15 feet of, of unsaturated soil between the top of slab and the, and the top of the mound underneath, underneath the, uh, the structure. And actually the six feet was at 44 Middle Street. And I mentioned earlier that we only have about one inch of water rise there. So the six feet is almost a natural condition that would occur without any mounting. When it does mound, the water table will rise about an inch up from there. So the results show, uh, and we conclude conservatively, that there's no water intrusion into these basements of the surrounding uh, library or the senior center as a result of, of a storm or the infiltration system. Now, water may enter the basement, but it's not a result of the infiltration system or the storm water. It could be a result of the property owners uh, drainage system itself, either the yard's not properly graded and they're directing their own runoff into their foundation through a stone wall, or their gutters aren't properly installed or operating or maintained and they're allowing water to collect about the building and water could work its way in through the foundation wall. But that would be a result of an on-site condition, not something that originated off-site. So that was the summary of, of, uh, of the analyses. I, don't, I can answer questions. No. Yeah. Can you hear me? Have you done borings all the way on this line here? Which way is the groundwater flow in here? Uh, we didn't do. We, I can't tell you with certainty which way the ground is flowing because we didn't. Uh, we didn't do work to determine groundwater flow. That was not part of the scope for the mounding. Not necessary for mounding and not necessary for the geotechnical design, foundation design of either of these buildings. I drilled that site. And I also did that site under a separate contract with another company. So I'm familiar with both conditions very well. That's for the, uh, that stabilized the building, is that correct? That boring you did? It, yeah. Not so much for drainage, but for foundation the soil support. for the foundations. Yeah, we, when we do that, we look at what type of soil we have, we check the soil, we test the soil. We also want to know where groundwater is, not only for constructability, but also for part of our design analysis for foundation support. We take into account where the groundwater is, that affects how much weight the ground can hold. So we're, we're aware of both of those cases. And it's from that data that we, we worked from. That data was available to do the mounting analysis. If we didn't have that data uh, from our borings, we would, have had to, uh, we would have had to collect that data. But that was readily available from previous borings. Just to give you a sense where we drilled, uh, more or less, I'm going off memory, uh, the, the senior center had three borings, one, two, three, uh, we did two test pits there, two test pits there, and then the borings on the uh, library, that was a few years earlier, so I'm working off memory, but I believe we did five, maybe one, two, maybe a three, four, and I think there was a third one back here of five. So roughly about three here and about two in the front here. How deep were they? The deepest, generally they were about 27 feet. The deepest one was 37 feet, and I believe it was on this side of the library. So between uh, 27 and 27 and 37 feet at the library and 27 feet, I believe, and I may even gone to 30 feet at the senior set. And water table in those borings for, uh, let's see, this one was done in, uh, I think it was 2016, we had a drought at that time and the groundwater was about 17 feet, I believe, 18 feet, is a little deeper. And then we came back here a year later to the senior center, the, we kind of had uh, come out of the drought, so the groundwater table had risen a little bit, and I think we're at about working off memory here, I have to look at my notes, maybe uh, 14 feet or so. It was between uh, 12 and 15 feet. At 12, 10 to 12 feet, we checked the ground, there was no water. At 15 feet, we found water, so we were saying it's between 12 and 15 feet. And we're estimating 
from our test pits, the highest groundwater we will see in the parking lot here naturally, without a rainstorm, would be about uh, about 10 feet below the existing ground surface. So, what month of the year did those test pits and those tests were done? The borings, uh, these I think were done in November, it was cold, I remember that, it was getting cold about November of the year, so uh, these here were done in May, and the test pits were done in June, July, uh, let me think about that, June or July, and also May. Is it possible to go back to the previous slide showing us the overhead of the parking and the buildings and show us where on that plan this collection is taking place? I can't. I can't. Is it on a green area? Is it? No. No. Underneath those. It's underneath the parking area. Oh, where, the where the water's water is infiltrating yeah, into yeah, the so ground? It's okay. To the park. Yeah. It's in parking. Um, so, in the park? this is generally, and VHB can certainly interject if I'm incorrect here, but this is one of the infiltration basin areas of the senior center, and here is the other one. There's mm -hmm. two of them. And I just joined them and made one large one. Conservatively, and that made it easier to do the analysis. So, part of the green area there then is considered part of the accumulation. Yeah, part of the green area, from my analysis, is, is included in the infiltration, meaning we're recharging the ground, we're adding water, but in reality, there'll be no water. So, there. so is it really not a green area, but a part of your collection system? No, no, no. no? I'm curious. Yeah, that's what I'm Okay. He just used the island between the two parking areas to make it easier for his calculation mm -hmm. to be more than generous on what could happen. When in reality, that's just greens. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, when in reality, there is uh, no accumulation area under that green area in the uh -huh. island. It was just easier for him to take. It was an engineering way to make it easier to calculate. Exactly. Thank you. And uh, I just, just want to just, add. just staying on this for a second. Uh, if I want to walk to the senior center from Middle Street or Russell Street or ride my bicycle to the senior center, where do I go? How do, I, how do I walk walk to that building this is, or, or ride my bicycle? So, uh, can we? Just yeah, stick okay, with the mouth. Yeah, okay, yeah, he's, he's not the guy to answer that question. Okay, well, I'll ask but we, that can be asked. I'll ask can, him we can get that answer. Yeah. I want to find out about that. That drainage system in front of that building. And the reason I asked that, this building here, they had um, leaching uh, catch, catch basins. This building ended up with mold. He took that all out, dug it all out, and tied it in directly to the drain. Is that going to be any problem on the west side of the library infiltrating into that building? Of course, there's no cellar there, right? Yes. The uh -huh. on slab, so that's going to help. Yeah. Well, these are both buildings on, on slab. These are buildings on slab, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay, so there's no cellar. So I just want to add a little bit to behind the library here. We have a, a storm drain system, an infiltration system right here, a long rectangle one, roughly, uh, I think it's about 100 feet by. 28 feet approximately, I'm going off memory here, the numbers. And then we have a small one here, roughly, uh, I think it's about 40 by, by, by 20 or so, 40 by 14, very small one here in the front. So the building, I understand the proposed building's library is going to be uh, at grade, there'll be no level below surrounding outside grade, so the, the potential for water to uh, uh, come into the building, groundwater coming into the building is, is unlikely just because your slab's uh, at the ground surface. So, now, now, to add a little bit to that problem with mold coming into the basement, so this building has dry wells around the perimeter. And while I was doing work here, drilling for the library, I had come to realize by discussing, uh, talking to people that, let me get my bearing here, it was this side right here, that in the past, probably original to the building, that there were they suspect there's pits of buried boulders in the ground uh, with intention of using those as infiltration systems and the roofs were tied into that. So at some later time, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, there was some work done to reroute their roof drains out to the street. So uh, I, I'm not sure if the water that was coming in and the mold that was developing was a result of the, we'll call it historical infiltration systems here that consisted of basically uh, holes, pits with boulders and cobbles in it or not, but I just want to shed some light on that. 
Can you tell me? What's this not one? Can you tell me why they're running a 12-inch pipe into a 10-inch? I can't understand that. Yeah. So is that solely because the town doesn't want to dig out to the trunk line? I I didn't design no. the uh, drain, so I think that. Of course. Yep. Please, the mic. Go for it. <laughs> Again, uh, Christopher Garcia with Garcia Gillespie D'Souza with Civil Engineers for the uh, library project. That 10-inch line, we had further discussions with DEP, came out again to look at it. It actually is north of where the overlay from Mass Highway was, so we're going to replace that 10-inch with a 12-inch uh, to match that 12-inch line on the north side, so um, I guess that is issue has been addressed. You're going to change that? Yes, sir. Yep. Good. Any other questions on the mounding? Mark, do you concur, just for the record? Um, yes, I do. I think something that needs to be understood is the amount of water that lands on this site is the same today it is going to be after we build it, after that's been built. So that volume of water is still hitting this site. They just have addressed it, slowed it down, and allowed it to infiltrate. So they're not adding water to the site, they're just addressing it to make sure that the increased pavement has an opportunity to go on the ground as it previously did. So how do you know that thing is going to leach the proper way from the bottom? Well, again, because it's, there's an overflow, the 12 inches, the overflow, right? Correct. I mean, this is standard engineering practice. You'd look at the soils, determine what the capacity and weight of the soil. That particular soil can absorb, and there's any complex uh, <coughs> calculations to uh, determine how fast the water comes in the volume. But the rate that it goes into the ground is based upon you know, historical evidence of that type of soil being able to absorb the, that water at a particular rate. So what you're, saying, what you're saying, no matter what kind of storm that hits this area, that's going to be adequate to handle it? Well, I, I want to clarify, the, the design that we review is we make sure that the, uh, after development, the runoff and the storm conditions are no worse than the existing conditions. It doesn't make... Uh, you know, the honeyer storm wonderful and turns the world into a wonderful place. We just make sure in our review that this construction does not make the drainage any worse than the existing conditions, so we don't make it worse downstream or downgrading from the site. Well, I just, I really can't see how with all that blacktop and all that roof, you know, the sheer runoff on that is not like infiltration on the whole property. This, that sheer runoff from the roof, the parking lot, well, that's the intent, is to give it an opportunity to go in and hold it long enough to allow it to infiltrate mm -hmm. in a smaller area, but it still allows it to infiltrate into the ground at what they call pre-construction rates and volumes. Anything else for the gentleman? Thank you. Mr. Reedy? Attorney Reedy. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I think we only have a couple of more items on our list of homework. Uh, one of them was providing to the planning board a, a letter, or as, as I suggested, in this case an email, from town council, Joe Bard of Koppelman, KP Luff, formerly Koppelman and Page, um, I guess confirming that the library is in fact the use protected by the Dover Amendment. And I think Joel in his analysis went through and identified that it needs to be um, primarily educational, it has to have educationally significant goals, um, and then also that the library itself is for a predominant purpose or primary purpose of furthering the achievement of those goals. And I think Joel's conclusion also that um, there is a dearth of case law on saying a library, a municipal library, is in fact um, a protected use because it, it to us seems self-evident, to me it seems self-evident that a library is in fact an educational use. Uh, is, it and is it primary use education? Is the primary use of the Absolutely. library for education? I'm just reading something here that I got off the web. Sure. Like mess. <laughs> My question was, is the primary use education? Yes. Uh, this is something I just got off the net, put out by the Mass Municipal Association. And this is the second condition. It says the applicant must demonstrate that the proposed use of the property for religious or educational purposes is not merely 
an ancillary use, but rather the dominant or primary one. Yes, so is educational the primary purpose of this library? It is. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, intrinsically educational. It has books where people can go and read and so learn. Barnes, Barnes & Noble has books, okay? But I, Mr. Sarzanski, I think we can draw a, distinct, uh, a distinction well, between books the Books are irrelevant, okay? We, I think we proved that by colleges saying books are irrelevant. I would suggest that a library that, I mean, I think the town understands how Goodwin has been operated. I think the planning board has a memo of how, uh, what other educational programs the library does in fact offer. And I think there is a distinction between a, a Barnes and Noble that sells books and a, the, the five college annex, which as the uh, board put it, was just a warehouse for books. Um, that probably would have rented out space for books to be stored there, as opposed to the active engagement uh, of education like you'll have in a library. Because the, the website doesn't say that it's for educational purposes, does it? I, I, it is, yes, it does. And I think we've got, you know, you look at the mission, Goodwin Memorial Library offers residents of all ages the means to meet their recreational, reading, viewing, and listening needs, a place to meet and interact with others in their community, support for students enrolled in local schools, the materials and support to know and better understand their personal or community heritage. And I think if you look at, not even to delve into what the law considers educational because it, it is broad and comprehensive. Some of the uses that have been deemed educational uses have even been those on the periphery of what you may consider a, an educational use. But this seems to me so intrinsically educational, so inherently educational that I think in and of itself, I mean, you get a library, think about it, you get a library card, you go to the library, you can take out a book, read, learn about, pick a topic. My mother went to the library for 25 years at the end of her life, twice a week, and she didn't consider it education. She went and got a couple of books and went home and read them. And I would suggest subtly that is education. Subtly? Maybe even directly. You know, your claim to the Dover Act you know, that you believe in. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in what Joe Bard, his opinion. I would like to have an independent lawyer that strictly works on Dover and zoning, uh, which got, uh, help out this board. Not Joe Bard and not you, of course. I've got the letter from Joel Bard in front of me, and uh, having the assumption that it is educational, uh, it appeared to some people after the meeting that this is like a get out of free jail card. However, quoting from Joel, uh, okay, uh, the building will be subject to regulations concerning the bulk, the height of the structure, side yards, lot area, setback, open space, parking, and building coverage. So it still is subject to our zoning. And I want to make that perfectly clear because a lot of people thought, oh, well, that's it. It's a get out of free card. We don't have to comply with any zoning regulations, but you do. That's correct. Reasonable regulations. And I think our uh, what we are proposing or suggesting is that the reasonable regulations would be to allow the parking as we're proposing especially justified by the fact that we've been through uh, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners and they have, in fact, uh, approved the grant for the funding. Tom, his Re final conclusion is that in conclusion, it is my opinion that a municipal library may, may be eligible for protection under the Dover Amendment. That's not a more likely than not opinion, is it? It may be? I think it, uh, like like anything, Mr. Sarzynski, I think it comes down to the facts and how something is actually going to be offered. Please ask, is that a more likely than not thing? I think... Or, or is it a nuanced opinion? I would suggest that in this context, given the programs and services offered by the Goodman Memorial Library, it is uh, an educational use subject to protection of the Dover. You don't, you don't want to say it's more likely than not because you know it is. It couldn't... couldn't Stand I mean, I, I'm saying sh it is. I mean, unequivocally, is in this circumstance. Let's have, I think let's have town council and independent council tell us that it's more okay. likely than not subject to the Dover Amendment. I think that would give so me that, some that really, I don't think, is the issue before us. Now, 
Joel had also given us an opinion that the uh, Five College Library was probably um, subject, to, was probably uh, entitled to protection under the Dover Amendment. But he did not have the benefit of eight hours of public hearing where it became apparent that that was a warehouse and not a sure. true library. Sure. There is no dispute that this is a true municipal library. But and we're, we're really splitting hairs here at, to just, um, we're, we're, the only issue really is, is parking and whether there is sufficient parking on the site. And uh, well, well, there's a big difference, Bill. Excuse me. Five Colleges Inc.'s library was owned. The annex was to be owned by Five Colleges Inc., a corporation owned by five institutions of higher learning. The Hadley Library, the proposed new Hadley Library, an existing library, is not owned or run by the school department. Rather, it's run by the town and the board of trustees. If, if, the, if this library were owned and operated and directed by the Hadley Public Schools, I think you'd have a pretty good argument. Well, I think that kind of undermines your point. I think it's a distinction without a difference. I mean, if we want to put it under the school system, it would be allowed, but the same building under the municipality isn't. Eh. Yes, because then it would be a school library. Please. Certainly we're, I mean, the opinion that you may have, the opinion that the audience may have, the opinion that town meeting may have, I and mean, we could have a couple of thousand different opinions. The opinion that we have to go by is our zoning regulations. So it's probably going to boil down to parking. Is the parking reasonable from our zoning bylaws for a structure of this size? And I think that's kind of going to be the genesis of future discussion here, but nevertheless, uh, we have to abide by certain rules and regulations, we being the planning board. I agree. I agree, Joe. And uh, by bringing up the donor Dover Amendment, you, op you guys have opened up a whole new can of worms. It, it becomes legal sleight of hand. If you could just abide by the zoning bylaw, no problem. <coughs> I know I talked to the, the superintendent of the schools to see the involvement. I certainly like to see documentation from the library that they worked hand in hand with the school department. What have they done? How long they have done it for? And what they can write anything here, their intentions. They wrote a letter. They're going to do this. They, anybody can write that down. What have they done? That's the question. And what I understand, it's not a hell of a lot. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may just address Mr. Sarzinski's point about complying with the zoning bylaw, and I think if you look at section 5.4.1 in, in the suggestion that this is some legal sleight of hand to allow this use in this area, I think stepping back, our fundamental position is that this site is adequately parked. The parking that we have on this site will be able to serve both of the uses. Stepping back from that and looking at 5.4.1, and I'll quote it directly, any building hereafter constructed or modified, altered or expanded for limited business, business, or industrial use shall be so located upon its parcel of land that there may be provided an off-street parking area equal to twice the floor area of the building to be constructed or existing buildings to be modified, altered, or expanded. This is not a business, a limited business, or an industrial use. And so if, if you're going to look for strict application of the bylaw, what are you going to apply to this? And so the you, you missed one paragraph, the fact we must not waive two for one parking. Very, very un un under Understood, but if you look at what it's applicable to, yeah. it is business, limited business, and industrial use. That is the threshold. Mm -hmm. to, to that the, the use or the zone? The use. Okay. It is business, uh, limited business, business, or industrial use. Uh, bear in mind, I only speak for 20% of the planning board. Um, you've given us no alternative standard to go by other than saying the parking is adequate. So if we have no alternative standard to go by, I think it's reasonable to apply <coughs> that standard to this project. 
And I would suggest that it's reasonable to apply a reasonable standard to allow a municipal use. Yeah. What's reasonable? You have given us nothing. We have suggested that the one space for 400 uh, gross square feet of floor area is reasonable as determined by a... Oh, uh, I thought we were talking about the senior center. Oh, no, senior center complies to the... Okay. Certainly. So maybe just to allow me to kick off the last uh, piece of homework we had and then we can get into whatever discussions generally that the board has, uh, was relative to the emergency access and the suggestion at last meeting that it could be conditioned on um, something. And I think we would suggest that the something is uh, constructed and operated substantially in accordance with the plans that we've shown here. Um, and I think it's a condition that the board has put on other projects, and then we would accept that condition as a condition of approval. Are you going to talk about 30 feet? Or? Well, just the only thing about the 30 feet is the um, town has a 30 foot easement. The proposed easement is over 50 feet wide. Where, where, where are you talking about? On the, the uh, right there. On that, that so lower be, corner. They it's, cleverly change that and avoid that. It's, it's not in well, this picture. Now. Well, it, it doesn't need to be. This is not part of the plan. So this is not part of the approval. The existing right of way is there where the parking spaces are shown. That is the retained right of way from the plan. Correct. It's actually from the. If that is that the boundary line there? Yes. 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 Okay. Yep. There's there's green space right here. So the easement on the plan and in the deed to the legion is subject to a 30-foot easement and it's shown on the plan as basically, well, 30.02. So it's from there to there to there to there to there. That is the recorded easement. But they moved it. They are proposing to use another portion of the legion parking lot outside the limit, entirely outside the limit of the right of way that the town holds. Right. Has anyone approached the council for the Legion concerning that e additional easement? Well, right now, the comment at the last meeting was there's negotiations going on between the Legion and the town for this extra space. Um, there is not. There is no negotiations going on with the Legion. The lawsuit that the Legion has filed is still valid. There was an agreement supposedly to, for the league to drop the lawsuit. That was over six weeks ago. The lawsuit has still not been dropped. So the lawsuit is still valid. Um, we can only go by what we have for facts. Those are the facts. However, the blueprints that were shown to us last time, and these are the ones we're going to have to sign, show that. Uh, there was more than a 30-foot easement, which we just discussed. There's a 50-foot easement, meaning that somebody has usurped 50 feet of their neighbor's property. And that was on the plans shown to us, and that probably is going to be the plans that, if, if passes, will have to be signed. How, how can you usurp your neighbor's property and make us sign that plan? There has to be some provision that and the fire chief said that it's necessary for safety and he needs that 50 feet uh, but it, it seems to be a dilemma here sure uh, certainly he didn't address the fact that there are two driveways coming in he said we need this uh, 50 foot and and so uh, how, how do we address that from a, a legal point of view I mean as far as the planning board is concerned I think that um you have it entirely within your authority to approve the plans as presented. And then if there is an inability between two parties to come to an agreement on what was shown on the plan as an emergency access, then something's going to have to happen. Um, well, so something is the question that we have. Sure. If the because we, 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 we approved I'm just setting so, myself we, up. I know, yeah, yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we approve the plans. Yes. Okay. Yes. This easement doesn't get approved for whatever reason. And what does that mean? So then we're, we're likely back before you requesting a modification of the approval in order to create a safe, uh, appropriate, appropriately circulated site if we're not able to secure okay. what it is that we're talking about. Okay. What I would like to do, I would like to see that out option now 
so that if this easement, for whatever reason, doesn't get approved, what's option B? Because by the time we approve this and negotiations are final, and suddenly this the buildings are being, the, the senior center is, is under construction, suddenly, oh, negotiations have fallen apart and we don't have this, what do we do then? We, 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 we can't tear the building down, we can't stop construction. We'd like to know ahead of time what is option B. And it sounds like before the issuance of the building permit would be a critical path on determining what that option B is. Okay. However, my only point is we're going to go through all of this, get approval. Now the easement isn't there. You're back to square one. You've gained, you gained nothing. You've wasted, you, boy, just like painting it now. <laughs> it's on. A whole, bunch, a whole bunch of time has been wasted between essentially today, let's just say it approves, okay, and the issuance of a building permit because negotiations have fallen apart. What is option B if this doesn't get approved? Not that the Legion is going to stop it or anything like that, but let's say, I don't know, but it doesn't get approved for whatever reason. Sure. What's the option B? You know, I think we had shown a plan, and maybe Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, that showed appropriate site circulation on the site without that emergency access. I think there was appropriate turning radii, et cetera, where we could get. Within here there is. Yes, there's appropriate turning the radius within here. But the, we, we have the appropriate turning radius. The issue is we'll have to <coughs> communicate with the fire chief that he won't have his access up or not. Right, I understand that. And that what that's, well, that's what I mean. What happens if he doesn't have his access off Route 9? Well, I'll have to communicate with him and find yeah. out. You know, and in case Bill's got a little mini explanation here, as opposed to we're not trying to delay this project, we're trying to get everything in order <coughs> before it's approved so we don't, we're not back here in two or three months from now, oh, we didn't get this, we didn't get this, we didn't get this. We want to make sure when this is approved, things are in order, Everybody knows what's going to go on, and if one doesn't occur, this is the other option that could happen. Because if this gets appealed, Bill can explain. So, again, speaking for 20% of the planning board, um, we want to get this done right the first time, and no unforced errors that create a gratuitous opportunity for an appeal. Um, so, I, one option, which I think uh, Mr. Reedy mentioned, uh, I was, had worked up this language. This approval is conditioned upon the Town of Hadley securing an easement for access across property of Old Hadley Post number 271 as shown on the submitted plans prior to issuance of a building permit. If the proposed access is not located on the existing easement, as the proposed access is not located on the existing easement. Failure to obtain such an easement will be considered a violation of the terms of the site plan approval. And that's fine as far as it goes, but as Mr. Maximoski pointed out, what is plan B if that doesn't happen before the time of the um, uh, issuance, what time you're looking for a building permit? So I just recently concluded a case in land court. It was not an appeal of a zoning decision, but it was literally almost four years to the day from the time the complaint was filed until the time we received the decision of the judge, 15 months after the trial. Um, and I want everybody to put that in context when we are talking about going through the process here and asking these questions and trying to nail down every point that the alternative is not that the senior center and the library will be delayed for two weeks or six weeks or two months, but they could literally be delayed for years if we don't get this right and don't make sure that all of the wrinkles are ironed out. Not to mention, um, you know, that's, that's where I'm coming from here, that there is uh, there's a, there's a real downside risk to rushing this. And it is not, at least in my eyes, an attempt to delay the project. Town meeting has approved it a couple of times. 
money has been appropriated, but uh, we're not, can't just launch into this until everything is, all the, all the loose ends are tied up. You know, I asked this question before. The Goodwin Memorial, the old, the old, the existing building, we're going to have, this town's going to have a white elephant sitting there and looking at it. There is no planning, no future plans. It just, let's hurry up and build this and the heck with everything else. I don't even go for that because there's five, I think five departments that sit in this building. They knock that building. Nobody knows, we don't, as a planning board, where, where are we going to be located? Out on the street? I'm not signing nothing here until we know all these facts. It's hooray for me and the H with you. And that's what basically what's going on here. The town, the selectmen, they failed to work as keeper of all municipal buildings where the plan is, they had a municipal building uh, committee. Nothing has been done and nothing has been talked about. Here, just talk about this, don't talk about that. But it's there. It's there. And it's the town and the taxpayers are going to be stuck with this thing. Where do I start? Go ahead. Um, I think one of the things, just to address your the most recent point is, I think the select board is taking a look at it. I know that they have a meeting tomorrow night. They've got an agenda item to talk about village center parking. So I think they are, I mean, they've been here. They have, they have a representative here. They're listening to you, John. They, they hear yeah. what you have to say. Right. Of course. Um, they may not have an answer right now, but they're certainly considering it. Give them a couple more years. And they will have an answer. Um, That's what I'll vote. I guess one of the things that you know we would like to know is where does the board sit on all of these issues? Because it sounds like we may not be getting the approval this evening because it sounds like an option B, and whether that option B is just eliminating those parking spaces and utilizing the entirety of that 30-foot right-of-way, which may change the design a little bit, um, or just to access entirely off of Middle Street. So it sounds like the board may want that information. But just as a reminder, the easement is an easement. I don't believe the easement gives the town the right of way to control that area. I believe it allows them to, I believe it allows the town to pass and repass and to utilize it for the way other roads are yeah. used in that. But again, the way the easement is worded, it's up to the attorney to decide what happens. They're changing the use of that easement. <laughs> so snowplow and truck could go through the easement if they have to? A snow plowing truck can, a snow plowing truck can enter the property from Russell Street and go through the Legion easement. Currently, no, in the future. Not if the police, not if the fire chief's chain is there. Right, and I think we would accept that as a condition of approval. Is that a B emergency access only? Did I understand you correctly that the uh, select board is looking to rezone or put a zoning amendment? for the village overlay district? No, then I must have misspoke. Uh, tomorrow evening, one of the matters of new business is center village parking. And something okay, that center going, village parking. Yes. Who proposed that? Usually the planning board has to David, do it. David Trudor from the Municipal Building Committee. It's in the uh, select board agenda. Yes, I think, it, I mean, obviously they're listening and they understand that there's a concern that the planning board has raised and they're looking to have the discussions before they actually take any action on those. Well, just by way of information, if you think you want to ease up on the parking in the in the district, uh, look at Echelon, parking on the common. Maybe you should build a parking garage there if you want to have it. So maybe, Mr. Chairman, if I can get a sense of where the board is, if you'd be so kind. Okay. We want to... I'll, I'll say the, the only note I've made uh, that I see as an outstanding issue is uh, application of the Dover Amendment to the parking. I think everything else has been addressed. That's what about one at a time? Excuse me. Yep. Mr. Zagrodnik? I, I think that distills it 
that certainly distills the Dover Amendment concern okay. because, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll concur with Bill and Alan. I'd like a couple make a couple of editorial comments on the overall design of the place. <clears throat> I guess this this is a good lesson for the town in that. No offense to anybody, but this was an example of a, of a putting the money, the cart before the horse, and that we approved money to build something without knowing in really good detail what we were getting. Um, the library is a, my opinion, again, 20%, this is as a town's person, not as a planning board member. The library is a very nice looking building. Brick facade, shingle roof, it fits in well with the other parts of the district, very nice looking, long term, low maintenance. The senior center, not so much. Um, it's getting put a, for whatever reason, a clapboard side building, siding on it that requires painting, not by any means low maintenance. Um, the building looks nice. Um, it's a good thing that it's set back from uh, Middle Street because the library will uh, overshadow, foreshadow it. Um, I just think that the, the library is a much nicer looking building and the design of it. Mr. Carlson. <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion under uh, section 8.4.2. Uh, the planning board shall obtain with each submission a deposit sufficient to cover any expense connected with a, with a public hearing and review of plans including the cost and any engineering or planning consultant services necessary for review purposes. And with that, I would ask for a special counsel like the senior center asked, but one that would represent the planning board on the Dover Act and the zoning issues. I'll second that. You have a motion and a second. I'd just like to say that, wait a minute, wait. Yeah, I'd just like to say that if we do have our own council, uh, and this council tells us that the Dover Amendment applies to this library, then I would have absolutely no problem uh, uh, voting for it. You were asking where we stand. Thank you. As to the, uh, as to the senior center, uh, you know, the senior citizen building committee had their Saul Alinsky moment. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Parliamentarian. So, I understand. So the motion is to request independent counsel on clarification of the Dover Amendment. And what was the rest of the jump? And the zone. <laughs> to deal with this total part uh, project and and the abutting one there, that that's not part of this, I think it is. At the expense of the applicant? Yes. No. Any other, any, any other discussion on this? I mean, this is, this is an overall general discussion about uh, town council appointment of lawyers. I think the selectmen started down a slippery slope, allowing a special exemption for a building committee to get their own town council. I mean, um, it's very able, but nevertheless, I've been on enough committees that occasionally disagree with whether the town administrator or the select board, they want their own lawyer. This could result in chaos. Every board is going to have their own lawyer. I, I don't think it's a great idea. I, I think we have enough information before us to make our own decision. We've had enough lawyers make their opinions, and now we have to make the decision. We don't have a more likely than not. So I, I would concur with uh, Dr. Zagrodnik. I don't think we need separate counsel. This is a very manageable issue. Uh, we can vote one way or the other, and uh, either the vote stands and is not appealed, or it's appealed and the judge tells us we're wrong. 
that's a much better way to find out what the law is than getting another opinion from another attorney. I withdraw my yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. I'm going to go back I about... Withdraw my second. Second withdrawn. Okay, I'm going to just make another editorial comment on this about... We've been on, I've been on this, obviously, several of us have been on this board for a long time. And probably about, I would say 30 years ago, an issue came up with a special permit. And I made the comment at the public hearing that, boy, I wish we could bring this to the town to vote on. And one of the members that the, this planning board has been in constant, uh, let's say, head knocking with, Mr. Joe Weinstein, Jr., very respected person, bless his soul, he passed away. And he made a comment to me at the meeting, and he says, that's what you are elected for. You are elected to make tough decisions. If you can't make the tough decisions, he says, then you probably should not be running for the board. And I respected that because he was right. I was, uh, I was uh, venting, if you would, and he made a comment to me that, you know, that's what you were elected for. You're elected to make these decisions. And that's what we are elected for. We're elected to make these decisions. We have some opinions. They're differing. That is absolutely true. However, we need to make a decision based on the opinions we have in front of us and the facts and everything else on zoning. Anyway, the motion is passed, is, is dead. However, Withdrew the second. Yeah, okay. The second. Yeah. Okay. So we were going through people's comments uh, on what the unresolved issues were. We got as far as John. He made his motion. And any other issues you want to raise? No, I don't know if I'm talking on deaf ears over here. You guys, you guys seem to have private meetings, and I don't know what the hell is going on with these guys. They invited me for a meeting, and I told them I'll meet them here at a public meeting. But both of you met them, the lawyer, this guy, the engineers, uh, at, a, at a private meeting. We sh you shouldn't be doing that. We were I want to make the right decision on this. Not what you say, not what Joe Bard said, and not what everybody else. What a lawyer that represents, truly represents us in the cause, so we do the right thing once and for all. Because this is not going to end here. We're going to be facing this again. And there shouldn't be any guessing in this. Yeah. Joel Bard's, Joel Bard's opinion was a bit tainted because of certain comments that the uh, chair of the select board made after we appeared at their last meeting, saying that questions that we were asking were inappropriate. OK? They were, that our questions were inappropriate. Well, you know, I look at this building here that's being proposed. Um, the Senior Citizen Building Committee had their, as I said, Saul Alinsky moment. They organized and they got 13% of the vote out, the town meeting of, of the total town registered vote out and passed this. Twice, and twice. Twice, twice, yeah, twice. twice. But, th but there's a great silent majority in Hadley that is appalled about what is happening here. But this is what we've got before us. Also two written ballots. Could you tell, could you tell them to keep, keep the order, please? Okay, keep the order. Oh, she had a gavel. So this is what we got. We got a, a proposed new senior center situated at the western, farthest western point of a, of a postage stamp lot. East, eastern, eastern end of the uh, postage stamp lot, bounded by a cornfield to the north, a drainage ditch to the east, as you can see, a parking lot, and then Route 9 to the south, and a sea of asphalt to the west. Cornfield, ditch, parking lot asphalt. We got a we got a bike stand. Apparently there's a bike stand and there's no way to ride your bike safely to this building. Unless you go through this parking lot, which I don't think is safe. 
uh, there's no way to walk safely to this building. You know, this isn't, this isn't the proper location for a um, senior center. It's more a proper place for a funeral home. Frankly, Chalusniax has better curb appeal than this. That being said, it's before us. I'm uh, disappointed that it has gone this far without some people who really, really are involved in development taking control. These people that have brought it before us were well-intentioned. They were appointed by the select board to essentially determine how a little over $14 million in public funds are gonna be spent. I would just like to read something from the minutes of the Senior Center, dated February 1st, 2017. The um, Municipal Building Committee met prior to that and strongly unanimously supported purchasing the land to the north of this uh, parcel. Jerry De Devine brought it up, uh, brought up the fact that the Municipal Building Committee was in strong support of the town buying the land adjacent to the north, as it was landlocked and might uh, might able to uh, the design to be less restrictive. The wait a minute, land adjacent to the north. All right, less uh, restrictive. It, it, yeah, I only got one eye, so please bear with me, okay? Um, a discussion followed, and it was decided that it was unforeseeable, variable, and was not worth putting plans off of a, by a minimum of two years. Everything was hurry, hurry up, bang, crash, boom, and hurry up and wait. And there's all kinds of mistakes. You can just take everything apart piece by piece on this project. There's absolutely no room for expansion. There's no room for snow. And the cost is going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money because these departments, the library and the senior center, are going to come back to the taxpayer. Oh, we need $10,000, $20,000, $50,000 more because that's unforeseen. John, what was the date of that? February 1, 2017. Attorney Reedy. Yes, sir. You've heard some, you've got a general feel. I have a general feel. Your comment. <laughs> um, I'll leave that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it, we would love an approval this evening. That's evident. We would love a conditional approval this evening. And I think that's evident. We did all the cuts. I'm just not sure that we're going to get that approval this evening from what I'm hearing from the board at this point. Um, it sounds like the remaining outstanding issue is the, and I don't know if the board feels comfortable making a decision about the Dover Amendment. I heard some members say, yes, it sounds like they do feel comfortable, but I'm not sure everybody does. What's yeah. your sense, Mr. Chair? My sense off the record is you've got a three to two vote. I think most people kind of sense to say similar things. And you need four, a super majority, which is a, sub, 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 which is a vote of four, not three. I assume I may be included in one of the three, but the the reasonableness of following the rules and regulations of the uh, zoning bylaws, reasonableness to anyone in this room is going to be different. We have a certain set of guidelines that we do have to follow because we could have five reasonable people on the board having reasonable opinions on how parking should be distributed for the buildings. That's going to be the tough question. If all of a sudden we feel like, well, like the Constitution, some people are strict interpretation of the Constitution, and other people want wiggle room. It's a living document to be changed all the time. Unfortunately, I, I look at our zoning bylaws, 
has the ability to be changed, but not by someone defining reasonableness. And uh, that's, that's the tough call from my point of view. And if all of a sudden we say reasonableness is what the town people voted at a town meeting for parking, so be it. And if you don't like it, see the Zoning Board of Appeals is in the audience. So uh, there, there is an alternative to interpretation of what the planning board de deems as reasonable. Well, and there, and there still is the one thing like, you know, of course we can make a conditional option B on the easement over there, but I don't think that's a holding issue right now so much. Um, What's the hang up? <coughs> What's the hang up? Uh, For what? When an agreement between the Legion and yeah, we don't really. Th that's, not, that's not our part of discussion. No, yeah. the, well, the, no. the, well it, 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 I, I understand that, Joe, but the thing is, for us, we don't know what the hang up is. It's between the Board of Selectmen and the Legion, and I think to try to get into that discussion may be a topic that would put somebody's hands at risk, so we don't want to, yeah, we don't want to guess. They have an executive session scheduled to discuss it tomorrow, but that's their jurisdiction, not ours. Well, it yeah. appears to be ours when the drawing was goes from 30 feet to 50 feet, and then we have to sign off on that. Well, uh, and, and, and so that, that's what... Yeah, so, so the real issue uh, on that point, the real issue is whether we want to go and get, uh, I can propose a conditional approval if, um, if the revised easement does not materialize um, and I've already filed a decision where we're back to reopening the public hearing and not exactly starting over again, but the question is do you want some time to work up Plan B, or you know, do you want to push it to a vote? I mean, I have a motion ready to, to read, um, but um, you know, I'm I don't know what you're going to get <laughs> when I read it. Yeah. And, and the downside of a no vote is a mess. Right. And I want to avoid. I mean. You know, we, we, I want to avoid a no vote, right. so I'm, I'm trying to get a sense. We, 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 we understand. Those and, you know, what would extra time, you know, a few, well, we can't meet next week because we have that, so next meeting would be in three weeks. What would three weeks get us? I'm looking, I'm looking to find a way intellectually I could become a fourth vote, and I am not there. Let me ask a question, Mr. Sarzynski. If there was a independent attorney that gave an opinion that you respected, an attorney you respected that gave an independent opinion on the Dover Amendment, one way or the other, would you abide by it? Who's going to pick the attorney? I think I would. That's what I said earlier. That was my whole point. I want an independent lawyer. I have an idea that I will discuss with you, but not at a public hearing. And I think we might have an answer to that one. Okay, I just don't want to put names out sure. here and put anybody on the spot. Sure. Okay. okay. So, as painful as it may be to the committees. For the record, I'm 67 years old. I know I look it, but I'm 67. Not at all. Some of my fondest memories as a kid, I'm a Hadley native, was spent in the North Hadley Library in the North Hadley Hall, open one night a week. Marion Pratt was a librarian. And uh, it was just a good time. North, that's when North Adley was North Adley. So, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you're going to look to take public comment. Oh, yeah, did anybody want to comment? Yes, I'm public, sorry. And then we can probably right, okay. talk about it. Hey, would anybody like to make comments from the audience? Yes. Hey there, I'm Al Weinberg, I'm 108 Bay Road, Hadley, and also a trustee for the library. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I've watched the planning board operate for many years, and I wouldn't have your job for a minute. And uh, 
I commend you folks for doing the best job you can most of the time. I think uh, it's a tough one of the toughest jobs in town. Hundred dollars so, a quarter, you can have it. Yeah, well, whether you're up for re-election, uh, I would like to offer something specifically on the parking, though, because I've heard that um, I've heard some comments about well, what is adequate parking? If, it, if we're trying to find what adequate parking is, give me some standards, give me some some basis for something other than what is in the bylaw, which is, which in my view is pretty vague and ambiguous, to be, on, uh, to be honest with you. But I've looked at a couple of things to, you know, around the country, even in the state, for additional guidance. And what, one of the things that we don't have in our bylaw, unfortunately, is a specific requirement for parking spaces. We've got this requirement for asphalt, but that's not parking to me. It's not parking spaces. But if you look at a number of um, other towns, cities, and specifically in the, the smart of, uh, which I'm sure you guys have looked at, the smart of um, parking um, proposal that's, that's basically a suggestion, it's not law, uh, a suggestion that uh, the state came up with, <coughs> the Massachusetts, and they have a, a table of what they consider to be uh, <coughs> required parking spaces for different uses. And I think if you if you um, key the number of spaces to a particular use, that's a good start. Instead of just saying, it's one size fits all. And their table has libraries, the maximum, this is per 1,000 square feet of gross um, floor area. So for the library, it's a 12,000 square foot building, so it's 12 times this table. And for museums and libraries, it ranges, the minimum is one and the maximum is two. Two only. That gives you 24 spaces. Now, the MBLC says they want two and a half, which is one for every 400. So that's, that gives, that's where we get the 30. But um, this, this is two. And then there's, no, there's nothing for senior centers, <clears throat> but there is something for social fraternal clubs and organizations. And they have, which I think is similar to a senior center, the minimum is three and the maximum is four. So four times, because the senior center is around 12,000 as, as well, four times 12 is 48. So 48 plus 24 is way less than what we're, we're proposing here. Now, I'm not saying we go by this, but I'm just saying this is something that somebody came up with, gave it some thought, and, and came up with these guidelines. I've looked at, uh, there's, there's, there's two or three others that I've found that I can share with you if you want, but, and they're all basically the same range, two to four for a thousand square foot for municipal type uh, you know, libraries and social clubs and that kind of thing. And I think that if we could use, I mean, if we use those numbers, then we're good, we're golden. And I think that's, it's, it's just as good as <clears throat> the two to one, which is, again, what you have to deal with, but it's so vague to me, it doesn't talk about parking spaces, it just talks about an area. So I just wanted to offer you that, that there is, uh, there are uh, um, other, um, documents that may provide some comfort level saying that we're consistent with some other thinking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> I see nothing. Okay. With that said, Next week, we have a very busy agenda with PVPC. Third Tuesday of August. Third Tuesday. Um, August is the 21st. Okay. So one other thing. Did anyone mention that we recently com completed a master plan for the town? Okay. We will continue this hearing to... August 21, 715, right here, regularly scheduled planning board meeting, and right here in the same room. Okay? Yes. Thank you. Motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is history. Thank you, and thank you, John. Thank you, audience.